Nation. I think City of Angels is about appreciating the little things that we all become jaded about. It's almost like getting back to the child's mind and and finding the the awe in something as simple as the color of that leaf over there. You know, it's it's very simple. One of the things that I liked a lot about it is it says that this existence, this sort of plane of existence, human life, is an exalted situation. I, I like that it's about love in a, in a really profound sense. And love is a, a precious thing. And we've been given a great gift. We're, we're complex, interesting uh, creations, us human beings. And uh, we've been given a, a wonderful opportunity to, uh, to live life. Life and death, living for the moment, taking a chance, risk taking. Um, daring to be human, I think that's uh, really the, the central theme. I think City of Angels, I know for me, is about um, sort of leaps of faith and the victory of faith, the courage it takes to believe in something that's unseen. It's about life and death, and it's about how closely connected those two things are. As with all things, it's one of the great things about human existence. If you don't have the bad times, you can't appreciate the good times. It's my pleasure today to introduce Dawn Steele. Uh, the idea came from my wife and partner, Dawn Steele who had the idea of taking the Vim Vendors film Wings of Desire and remaking it, but really taking what was the main inspiration of the film, which was the idea of an angel falling in love with a mortal, a human. I know that Dawn had a great fascination with angels, and I know that she stuck with this project in, in the face of the other angel movies because she felt like this is the one, you know, this is, this is a movie that takes the ideas most seriously. I, I get it. I mean, I've always gotten it hearing you say it. Really? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, its impact is there, you know. So that means there is a soul. One of the most treacherous things about the script has always been how to integrate philosophy and romance, if you will, and, and ideas and, and how they'll merge with keeping a romantic story going on. And actually, I'm learning to just focus even that much more on what the heart of the film is as you discover it. I mean, it's a, it's a continuing process. And the beauty of the screenplay that Dana wrote is that there's so much going on and there's so many moments. If this is all you are, these cells, then when they die, that's the end. I don't know, I, I think so. A lot of the film is that. It's how do you marry uh, ideas, questions about spirit questions about consciousness and and yet tell a, tell a good love story our angels in the in the film are really here to observe life so unlike a lot of the other stories you'll see where there are these sort of divine interventions going on and somebody coming to stop billy from stepping in front of a bus we chose to really Take a, take a step aside from that. From the very beginning in my, my very first initial meetings with, uh, with Chuck and, and also with Brad, it was important for me to understand that angels are not um, the superboys of the spiritual world. It's not as though we can take the bullets out of the chamber or we can really avert the liquor store heist, you know. We can only offer compassion and comfort for those who seek it. Be cool, man. What we tried to do was to work out, and still are obviously as we shoot, working out the way we can cut it so that any mortal's point of view hasn't got angels. considering designing the angels. We had decided early on that we were not going to make them like the popular idea of angels at all. 
We were trying to make them like shadowy people who are around us and among us. And it, it's almost that we could see them were we more observant. And I also wanted something that completely hid the corporal nature of our angels. They're really just faces. And the only thing that's solid about them really is they're rooted in very heavy dark boots that just sort of ground them. And I guess that was a little bit of a visual joke because they don't leave footprints. Angels aren't human. We were never human. What if I just make her a little pair of wings out of paper? Tell her the truth. And cut! One of the things that Brad added, which is such a wonderful image, is he wanted there to be some moments in the script that are something that angels get to do that no one else gets to do. And we came up with the idea that they come to the beach, you know, they come to watch the sunrise and the sunset. And of course, that's a, a key image in, in the whole movie. Seth is he's kind of a rebel angel, uh, kind of a, he's the odd angel, he's the Pinocchio angel, you know, he wants to become human, he wants to be a real boy. What we talked about in trying to find the arc of Nick's character relatively early on was sort of a journey in three parts, and that his angelic self um, is of one existence, that as he has to play at being human, is a second stage, if you will, and then finally, once he makes his leap and falls and becomes truly human. Yes. She's been disoriented, confused. Dimension, I want it to be clear that he's very restrained and uh, almost hypnotic in his observation. I want to hopefully not blink and, and just be observing at all times. My name is Seth. Where are we going? Home. I like that. Yeah, because it's yeah. it's it's real it's real and it's connected, yeah. and yet cause yeah, yeah. he is as we we know he's other. You know, yeah, it's great. Yeah, yeah. Where we struggled was find covets human life. But what I'm suggesting is that as angels, I don't want us to come off too robotic, and that That's we we love them, and and yeah. even though we we can't feel the way they yeah. feel, mm -hmm. really? maybe something should be said to the extent of that is why. That's also why they're beautiful. I, I don't I don't know, is that too much? It's just hard for me, it's frustrating for me. I quickly became frustrated that it's impossible to play an angel. Uh, and I'm learning that. What do you do when you're an angel? Do you move? Uh, do you have gravity? <laughs> and there's a piece in here, you'll see at the beginning we see we see the speedos, but there's a great piece right when you get hit though, which is great. I just start touching my face implies that I can feel. I mean this means I have touch. 96 takes. I wasn't in character. Well, that's me. Uh, let's look at the, the end of take one, please. I mean, if I were to play an angel in the purest sense, I would just be singing through the whole thing. You know, no matter what happened, praising everybody, even in their pain. And uh, then we'd have no movie. Step back, step back, step back. That's just a fabulous piece. I mean, you see a way it, it, it stopped too much. It's cold and wet and windy. <laughs> Have you ever considered freedoms? Freedoms from the opinions of others? Even when did you learn to do Marlon Brando? Sort of a rite of passage for men. Cut! Cut it! Cut! Yeah! <laughs> Meg was the, the first actor uh, in a major role to sign on, and that gave us some extra time to work on her character. Are those are the only changes? Well, the, 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 there, there's this back at the top. In the original incarnation of Maggie, you know, she had lines like, I'm a scientist, I don't have faith in anything but medicine kind of thing. And um, Meg was saying, it isn't about science. Mostly it's an experience of being the person who is in control, no longer in control. I, I suddenly have this feeling that None of this is in my hands, nothing. Her paradoxes are things like she operates on people's hearts, and her brain is occupied with it in a mechanical way, but something else is pulling the strings, and she has not an intellectual knowing about it, but an experiential one. 
I mean, she is the person at this point in the movie who's just made the decision that she's going to figure this out. She's now on a mission to understand. She becomes mm -hmm. like a, a, an aggressor mm -hmm. in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she wants to find out. Yeah, she, she asks wants all to these questions. figure this out. She has a, her empirical mind is now trying to figure this out. Well, do you what want, is this thing? Do you want me to change the language on this? Meg Ryan has, in certain ways, is greater, greater a chore uh, in terms of pulling off the character of Maggie, um, as Nick has with his character Seth, because you need to believe this woman as a consummate heart surgeon who obviously is advanced in her field to be doing what she's doing at a very ripe and young age. So there has to be a credibility there, especially for an actress who the country knows as their sweetheart. Tall, tall order. And Meg was just the person to do it. And, you know, I obviously haven't done too much. <laughs> heart operation. But um, the other thing was feeling so uh, kind of r sort of profoundly am amazed by what they do. That you don't want to be facile with it and you know you, you really want to be as specific as you can about the action of it. And, and the thing about the heart operation which is so cool and interesting is that even though it's all about that science and all about a procedure there's still a moment in every one of those bypass operations where they have to wait and see if the heart will start beating again. And it's just the suspended moment of pure faith. Truly, this is the thing I talked to Dana about at the beginning of the movie. This one of these doctors said, I asked him, I said, um, do you believe in God? He said, no. I said, have you ever seen a miracle? And he said, yeah. And I think that's Maggie. We fight for people's lives in here, right? People over to the other side when they die, and a doctor who's trying to keep people alive, and that, that struggle. She's boxing with, with God in a way. She's saying, you're not going to die. I'm going to make you live. So that their very first kind of look at each other is, is pure conflict. He's going. He's not going anywhere. If this woman, Meg Ryan's character Maggie, is to have her heart taken by him, there has to be very good concrete reasons other than the fact that he may be handsome in a long dark coat. He's playing Seth as such a um, innocent and as such a, um, you know, at the same time such a man that it's, I don't have to worry about, oh, why is she falling in love with this oddball guy? I mean, I, I, he makes the character make a lot of sense. There is that, that mode, if you will, where he chooses to show himself to Meg's character. Excuse me. And so that we don't think she's out of her mind, he needs to at least play at being human convincingly enough that she's not going to suspect. Are you a visitor? Yes. It's a little bit frustrating because I, I, like I feel like for about three quarters of the movie, I haven't been able to see what he's doing <laughs> or even look at him because so often... I'm not seeing him when he's there. So I always have to ask somebody else, what did he just do? <laughs> the library in our film is the home of our angels. It's sort of the representation of heaven in the film, which is why we picked the San Francisco library. It's really spectacular. It has an incredibly heavenly feeling about it. It is quite colorless. There's white light, white walls. It's a, it's a very simple palette. When you walk into the San Francisco Library, you automatically look up because it's just the way the building is. It just drives your eyes up. And it just, first time I walked into it, I said, That's, it's heaven in here. Hey, guys, I'm right above you here. Though you've offered anything to Meg, is there a possibility that you, may, you might still lead her out? Action! Action! The difficulty was because they'd never had a, a film crew there, they only wanted us to shoot off hours. I believe we were on a 3 to 3 shift and then that went to a 10 to 10 shift, 10 p.m. to 10 a.m. Really insane hours and shoot some very difficult work in terms of drama for, for uh, the characters of Seth and Maggie. Close your eyes. It's just for a moment. They both have an early um, kickoff scene to their relationship there and then run the gamut to their what amounts to their breakup if you will. I mean, it's got such a built-in sort of lovely formality. Mm -hmm. if, if that sole goal becomes about just putting her at ease. To have to play real performance scenes 
in a location where there's a ticking time clock on your head is just like dancing in front of, you know, firing squad. You know, I acted once after eight days without sleep. Eight days. Uh, that was Con Air. Oh, so the, that, that was a recent experience? Yeah. <laughs> this is a piece okay. of cake. It makes it relative here. Let's <laughs> go. Cool. Erica, check that, please. Check the gate. There's a wrap. If the gate's clean, that is a wrap. Brad and I talked a great deal about what this movie was going to look like. Basically, Seth sees things from far away, from high up, from above, and sees the whole context. And I definitely wanted to make sure that we saw the world the way he would see it. We want to show that these angels can go into any environment that they want. We wanted to, to, to shoot the film from a perspective of an angel and constantly put them in places where humans don't usually go, in high places, and they're able to get up there with the speed of thought. that I think any man would feel if they were up 57 stories. I don't think they would have put John Gilgood up there. He probably could have a heart attack. We had a real interesting visual dilemma for our film, which was that uh, Dennis Franz's character, he's a, a metal worker on skyscrapers, and we had a scene where he takes Nick to his place of work in the middle of the night, and Ned is sitting on a big I-beam the 50th story of an open sky, uh, skyscraper under construction. Now, this is a very interesting issue. I don't know if you're familiar with Lewis Hine photographs, but they are all of the photographs taken while the iron workers on the Empire State Building. And when I showed these to Brad, he said, at that point we were still, that he was still considering that we would build this on stage and blue screen it in. And I said, there's nothing, nothing can compare with the reality of it. And my production designer is a woman who comes primarily from reality-based films. And so she said, well, why not think about building um, you know, a piece of skyscraper construction on top of an existing roof pad? You know, I met with Chuck Rovin and, and Brad Silberlein, and they showed me the model with which they wanted me to imagine, imagine being the key word, what it was going to be like when they built it. And I said, I understand you want to get this great shot, but I, I don't know what it's going to be like. I can't, I can't imagine what it's going to be like. Obviously, as everyone can see, this uh, set could be very dangerous if not looked, uh, looking up, looking around, paying attention. We will be putting Nick and Dennis up at the top of that scaffolding in two seats. If I had a true phobia, I would not have been able to do the scene. I think that's, that, that kind of goes without saying. But when I got there, and Dennis was the same way, when we finally got up there, it became clear to both of us that we were going to have a very hard time <laughs> remembering our lines and knowing what we were doing. So as we start shooting, I charged up there to see it and brought him up, strapped him in, he promptly came down and said, I truly don't know if I'm going to be able to speak. I just said, are you going to put a violin player up there when he's trying to do a, a symphony? I mean, he's not going to be able to hit the notes. I mean, it was just a day just ripe with horrors for the poor guy. So I told him about halfway through the day, you now have the privilege of making me do anything, anything you wish. And he said, I just want you up there for 10 minutes. So I charged up there when the time was right. Chuck Rovin, the producer as well. We strapped in and, uh, and and got the view. See, Cage doesn't think I can actually do this scene. Chuck knows he can do Dennis's job better than Dennis can. So we're just trying to prove it. Well, I'm going to do Dennis's part. Yeah. I kind of have more of the build of Dennis. And he's got more of the build of Nick. In my fantasies, yeah. Was... Hey, boys, we're going back up. Can you turn your phone off? <laughs> yeah. Things are starting to get gnarly. Get a little numb. 
<laughs> well, can you see Chuck? Right. Yeah, I want you to imagine the platforms not being there and like what it would be like being up there for an hour and then acting. It's wild, isn't it? Yeah, well, this is definitely going to be one of the most inter interesting nights of all of our lives. And, uh, <laughs> well, you know, we're all friends now. I was there in the stairwell when you cried for your patient, and I touched you, remember? Why are you doing this? Because I'm in love with you. What makes for great romance in any film is the fact that you have people who, you know, Romeo and Juliet, you, you have people who are not meant to be together, and yet overcome whatever it is that they have to to be together just get out get out i'm gone <laughs> i'm gone seth is tired of being in this angel existence he wants gravity he wants to push and pull he wants to eat he wants to lie he wants to do all the things that he sees these people do whatever he can to be with her he can fall he can give up his existence as he knows it he can give up eternity and become one of us